groups, uh, averaging and coarse graining. And then there is a more mathematical oriented group by Professor Kiyowski, uh, who works on mass and en energy definition in GR, gravitational radiation and alternative gravity theories. Mm. This is the this is the people. So Professor Kiyowski is currently working on his own. My group consists of Nezihe Uzun uh, and Mateusz Kulejewski, who is a master's student. And up until his PhD defense in, in 2023, I also had a PhD student, Julius Serbenta. Uh, Nezihe, by the way, is pursuing her own research project, Polonis Bis, Wavization Quantization of Observables in Universe. A few words about our international collaborations. So I have a collaboration with, Nez with Asta Heinessen from uh, Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, where we work on position drift and redshift drifts in cosmography. Uh, basically, we assume that the universe expands, but we don't know whether this expansion is homogeneous and isotropic. So we try to develop the most general parametrization of assuming that uh, the expansion is not necessarily isotropic, and we try to see what data from, from this parametrization we could fit with what kind of measurements, uh, and what we could infer from multiple decomposition of the Hubble drift, Hubble law and drift uh, uh, measurements. Then I also have a collaboration with a Master of Science student from Warsaw, where we work on the problem of amplification of redshift and position drifts close to acoustic. I think I will talk about this in, in, during this semester in, in, in July, uh, I already have a slot booked at, at our institute seminar. And we work on a simple example, uh, moving gravitational lens and source. We would like to see the spectral redshift effects and the position and redshift drift. Uh, Professor Kioski has also collaboration with Gerd Rudolf from Leipzig, uh, with whom he works on discretized quantum field theory on lattice. Uh, this is shortly the papers published by, so on top you see the papers published and, and uh, my part of the, of the group has only purpose in progress but fairly close to completion. I will just say one slide about the first of these uh, papers uh, and then I will give, my, give the microphone to Professor Kiyowski. So the paper I would like to talk about uh, is about exact relations between optical observables. Uh, when you learn about gen uh, geometrical optics in general relativity, there's a fundamental relation you, you may learn about called the etheric tons reciprocity relation between the angular diameter distance and luminosity distance. So you can measure distance to a f distant object by comparing its angular size with its physical size or by comparing its uh, bolometric luminosity uh, with its, uh, its apparent luminosity or the flux of energy with its total luminosity you, you, you somehow infer. And it turns out that even though these are very different distance measurements, there's an exact relations between them. And just wanted to, I wanted to state that this is not a trivial fact. It looks like a trivial equation that one distance measure is equal to the other times one times a redshift factor, but it's actually a pretty compli complicated thing to prove. Uh, it was proved by Etherington, then this result was forgotten. Uh, and Etherington, by the way, got this result a little bit wrong. And then it was discovered first perturbatively and then non-perturbatively by Roger Penrose, I think. So it's not a trivial fact that this, this works. Uh, Nezihe Uzun showed in one of her papers that this actually follows from the fact that the dynamics of uh, light rays, neighboring light rays displaced in perpendicular directions uh, conserves the symplectic form. It's a symplectic problem. Uh, and one of the consequences of this fact is this relation over here. But the general linear dynamics uh, also conserves the symplectic form, even if we allow for, for example, time-like variations of, uh, of the null rays. Moreover, there is many more. Uh, this is just one scalar equation here, uh, this one over there. In principle, uh, the whole dynamics conserve the symplectic form, so there is a possibility for more uh, exact relations between various apparently unrelated observables just because of the symplectic part, uh, symplectic property, and we wanted to drive all possible ones. We applied the bilocal machinery, which we already had. Uh, we looked at various variational observables, the drifts or the variations of position, redshift, the parallax effect, and we managed to find all possible relations 
due to the symplectic form. So all possible generalizations of the Atlantic relation. There is four more relations. For example, there's an interesting one between the position drift or proper motion of something on the sky and the parallax of the redshift effect. So how the redshift varies when you move, move the observer a little bit in the transverse direction. Okay, that's, that's all about my group and I give the mic to Professor Kijowski. Professor Kozinski asked me to uh, tell you the remaining part of the this story myself. So, in '37, Einstein proved, in quotation marks, that gravitational waves do not exist. <coughs> so the red lights <coughs> were turned on to all the research on gravitational waves. Nevertheless, Angel Troutman in 58 wrote his PhD thesis where he gave uh, <coughs> the conceptual framework and mathematical tools which are necessary to uh, describe gravitational radiation. Main <coughs> The conclusions of his approach was that, first of all, radiation is not a local phenomenon. You cannot just at a certain point say that, ah, this part of this uh, field is radiation and remaining part is not. No, this is a non-local phenomenon. <coughs> it is localized at infinity, whatever it means, <coughs> At that moment, it was not fully clear, and boundary conditions are fundamental. Whenever Andrzej Troutman is praised that, ah, you gave this, you had this fundamental result, he says, no, I have only generalized Sommerfeld radiation conditions from electrodynamics to general relativity. Roger Penrose in 68 found uh, some uh, definition of this infinity, which I don't like very much, and this will be, I will tell you why. Um, there is a, a standard object that the interior, the interior of this uh, represents the space-time and the boundary are those additional points at the boundary which, according to Roger and Penrose, they have to be added. Um, but this con construction is based on using a totally fictitious metric at infinity. We know that at infinity, infinity everything is uh, infinitely great, therefore there is no uh, metric. However, using this fictitious metric, uh, Penrose construction led to that. Uh, I will mainly concentrate on uh, future uh, null infinity, but of course it is symmetric. Moreover, there are those uh, spe specific points, <clears throat> but the main result of Troutman was that to each two-dimensional slide, for example, at future null infinity, we may assign uh, some energy which has not been radiating yet, and uh, this was usually called ball, uh, bondy energy, uh, energy nowadays, <clears throat> together with some people, we try to convince people that it is Troutman Bondi energy because Troutman was the first. And many people use now this uh, terminology. In su uh, having such an um, extension of space-time, we may describe uh, incoming radiation and outgoing radiation. And uh, in 2001, we have written a book together with my former PhD students when we tried to make some order in this. <clears throat> so what are those uh, points of the sky? 
Usually, we tell students that these are endpoints of light rays, but it is not true because each point of the sky collects a two-dimensional two family of light rays, which form a three-dimensional null hyper hypersurface. Now, let us be more modest and consider only flat space-time, Minkowski, in Minkowski space-time, those uh, <clears throat> a point may be uh, um, uh, explained to be a hyperplane. So those this two-dimensional family of light rays collects into a flat null hyperplane. And any solution of the wave equation defines uniquely a certain function uh, on the sky. This is my old result, I believe, 10 years old. So, so you do not need to use very complicated definitions and so on. Um, but it is very simple geometric construction. This function on the sky may be called radiation da data. And now the main conclusion is that the transformation between initial data, which you know for the field, the position and velocity, and the radiation data is a canonical transformation, which simply uh, simplifies enormously field evolution. So, <clears throat> Symbolically, uh, initial data on this picture may be wrote like that. There is a, uh, I know, uh, this is Cauchy data with the Hamiltonian, standard Hamiltonian, which you know, whereas the radiation data is a function which is situated at infinity on this cry, and again, it has a specific symplectic structure and a Hamiltonian, very simple Hamiltonian. And now, <clears throat> if instead of the true Cauchy uh, data, we want to represent data on a hyperboloid, then we know that we do not uh, capture uh, the entire information about um, uh, about the field because uh, from the data on a hyperboloid we can uh, capture radiation de 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 data above and not below. Therefore, this is not a, a correct description of the radiation and uh, I have proposed the mixed Cauchy radiation picture, which means that we, as a uh, initial data, we treat part of the radiation and part of non-radiation. And this is indeed uh, the Hamiltonian is uh, this part which describes uh, the non yet not yet radiation uh, not yet radiated uh, energy and this part describes uh, the uh, energy which has already been radiated this is an autonomous hamiltonian composed system <coughs> and uh, the two subsystems namely this and that interact via the common edge condition now uh, the important observation is that, after all, what is here, which the uh, shape of this hyperboloid doesn't matter because both the uh, information contained is the same and the energy is contained uh, is the same. Therefore, what really matters is this boundary. Therefore, this uh, nice physical system is composed of two subsystems, namely one which is described by a two-dimensional section of the sky and a part of the sky. And there is a unique uh, um, definition of the energy which is assigned to this subsystem and this is precisely which this Troutman bondy energy and it described how much energy still remains to be radiated and 
the already radiated energy. The total energy is, of course, constant because it is a, a conservative system, and because th this age uh, minus grows as we go further and further in time because we take into account more and more energy, which simply means that this troton bondity, bond energy is diminishing. Uh, and now, main conclusion, every hyperbolic uh, theory admits this uh, description of, as a curiosity. Maxwell equations are just two decoupled wave equations. If you solve them, you know everything about the, uh, the, the field. So it fits into this framework. Linearized Einstein equation too, because linearized Einstein equation can be described by two decoupled wave equations. But what about the nonlinear gravity? Yes, it also fits into this picture because uh, all this story, uh, sorry, it is here. Uh, the dynamics happens at infinity, which means that if we impose boundary conditions uh, that uh, space-time is asymptotically flat, this means that here the field may be described by the linear theory. And the fact that there is something non-linear inside doesn't matter, or at least it matters, but we know how to describe it. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's thank both speakers for very nice talks. Are there any questions? Okay, Marek. Okay, go ahead. So, out of curiosity, how did Einstein prove that there were no... Uh, it was an error. Yeah, yeah, there, there was an error. Um, okay, when I am claiming that it's true, some people protest because they say that after all, somebody has found his, uh, the, uh, the, uh, somebody has found his hair or, and so finally this paper did not contain this uh, rigorous statement. Where, where, where was the error was, yes, the idea of the error was that he used some coordinates and he didn't realize that these coordinates as in fact uh, cylindric coordinates. He treated them as asymptotically flat coordinates. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. So let's thank the speakers again. And we are moving to the next uh, talk, which will be given by Wojciech Bruzda, who is actually my postdoc. And he will report the achievements of the task number two. He will tell us about entanglement in multipartite systems and, I guess, about quantum officers, no? Mm, yes. Uh, can you hear me? I think you can. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to be a representative uh, this year. Uh, title of my talk is Multipartite Complex Quantum States. But before I show you what we did in 2023 let me remind you the group structure it is led by professor marek kush and professor karl Rzyszkowski. and last year we had uh, four collaborators here you have their names in alphabetical order one of them jan głowacki obtained his phd in uh, september 2023 uh, this is only a selection of papers which uh, were written in, uh, in the last year. Uh, well, anyway, as you can see, everybody wrote some, something and uh, it was even published, so everything is okay in this matter. Um, I will show you some result. Actually, I will show you some progress which was uh, done uh, during last year. You might have a wrong impression that you've seen this before, but this is not true. Uh, don't be confused. I will show you something which is uh, new. This is a spoiler you can see here for hexagons. So some of you might already guess what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but before I tell you, I have to set the stage. Very briefly and concise uh, reminder for those who accidentally forgot what quantum entanglement is. We have at least two physical systems. 
entanglement, physical entanglement is just considered as correlations between, between those systems. Uh, and we can quantitatively measure entanglement. There are many measures of entanglement and there are many entanglements in physics, but we can roughly put it in order or rather distinguish particular classes of entanglement from uh, states which are not entangled through partial entanglement up to maximal entanglement. And our focus is to investigate systems which are, where is pointer? Which are maximally entanglement with respect to some measure, whatever it means. Uh, our concrete scenario is the following. We consider a composite physical system which has four parties and each party has equal number, all parties have equal number of degrees of freedom. You may think about this like uh, four particles and each particle has uh, six uh, energy levels which are accessible and our assumption is that we are consider we, we, we consider only formalism of pure states, no mixed states at all during my presentation. And our goal is to construct or to disprove existence of maximally entangled state in this setting belonging to such 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 a space which corresponds to the four party system. If such states exist, it is called absolutely maximally entangled, and we denote it as MF4D. Uh, as we know, if D is 2, there is no solution. If D is a natural number except 2 and 6, there are many solutions, many different solutions. And this problem for D6 was open until 2021, where we provided a solution, which was later a year, a year later published. Uh, of course, all of this requires uh, clarification and formal mathematics, but I decided uh, to not to show a single formula during my, during my presentation. Instead, I will show some hieroglyphs. Uh, this is a solution which was presented in PRL. You have to believe that this represents a unitary matrix of order 36 by 36. I'm not going to explain details here. Please use your imagination. Later, when pizza comes, I will I'll be happy to, to explain all, all details. Um, but what is important here? Important here is, OK, you can ask, so what's the point? Why do we consider such particular solution if we know that there are many solutions in other di dimensions? The answer is simple because this particular solution is, uh, so to say, most quantum. All other solutions for other dimensions are, well, roughly speaking, semi-classical or just physically boring. This is not boring. That's the simplest explanation. Uh, OK, so what we did in 2023? We asked several questions and we answered some of them. The first question is whether such a solution is uh, we are still considering this uh, particular scenario where the local dimension is 6. So the question was, is this solution unique or not? No, it's not. We showed that there are many inequivalent, unitarily inequivalent solutions. We also showed that it admits internal non-trivial parametrization, which provides additional flexibility in, in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, fancy matrix here. We also asked whether we can construct a particular solution in a special class of states. And here, the answer depends on, on the class, actually. Sometimes it is possible, sometimes it's impossible to have additional features in such states. And the question, which is quite important right now, which we don't know the answer yet, is about full classification of all inequivalent solutions in this dimension. This is with, without, it's impossible to answer this question right now. Uh, these are mathematical questions, and also there are purely physical applications. Uh, I am absolutely not an expert in, in this matter because I'm not experimentalist, but from my colleagues, which are mostly uh, 
they, they know something about solid state physics. They, they, they know what they can ask, and there are several questions which can be asked, and uh, they might be interesting. Concerning this state, here you, here, here you, ha here, here you have uh, on, on the slide what, what's going on. I, ha I have no idea what Newton probe is. I have no idea what quantum array there is, so don't, don't ask me. This is, I, I just wrote it to, to have it here. But what we can do is to, 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 to consider quantum benchmarking. This state, this state, as I said, is the most quantum one in this, uh, in, among all these dimensions. So we can try to realize it physically, but for theoretician, physical realization is, is, is written here as a quantum circuit. We are trying to build a quantum circuit which represents such a state to be implemented soon on quantum computers yeah. uh, and this requires some knowledge which we we have some partial solution which is not full yet we have to find optimal and analytical decomposition of this huge 36 by 36 matrix and if we can do this then we'll be able to represent such a state in a similar manner like here, like a quantum circuit with some QHEX or qubits, whatever. When, when we know how to do this, you will be informed immediately by archive. And so far, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Wojtek. Any questions? Yeah, I can ask some question. So, in experiment, even if they manage to have some entangled states, sometimes it's very difficult to prove that the state is really there. So how to, what one should check, what tests should be done to verify that exactly this state was achieved? Do you have such protocol actually in hand for pro experimentalists or not yet? It's a good question, uh, especially for me. <laughs> uh, okay. What I would answer if uh, if I had to having such a circuit would be just enough for me to 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 confirm uh, all properties of such a state. Uh, but okay, this doesn't this doesn't answer a physical aspects of of this. So yes, because if implemented on quantum computer all these gates will be very noisy and then still you are not sure yes this is we we, are, we don't consider uh, robustness yet so we are just trying to have some um, theoretical uh, considerations only so at this stage i cannot uh, i cannot provide you a satisfactory answer i'm sorry okay still thanks Uh, hi, so I have a question and also a partial answer to the previous question. I think this thing is low dimensional enough that you can just do like full state tomography and it's fine. If you if you can actually build this thing in a quantum circuit, you can do tomography without too much overheads and it should yes. be okay. Um, of course, yes. But, yeah. to, some to some extent. Nothing is perfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, my question is you mentioned briefly that um, the armor state in other dimensions is boring somehow or not physically so interesting. Can you explain like why what's different about it or why it's not so interesting in like Ds, three, four, whatever? Because mostly the the other constructions come from uh, permutation matrices and existence of uh, mutually orthogonal Latin squares. So this is uh, why I said uh, that they are so to say boring because this state here, this state represented here. You cannot see it, of course, but it uh, contains uh, non-trivial uh, amplitudes, non-trivial phases, and not just uh, ones and minus ones like this in a permutation or a slightly improved permutation matrix. So that's why I said it's uh, boring. Yeah. Is it clear that nothing like this exists in other dimensions? Uh, yes and no, because uh, you can have something which is called uh, local unitary equivalence. So you can always complicate your state. But you rather wish to have something which is the simplest possible. And this is the other way around. This we cannot simplify. OK, thank you. Any other question? No, so let's move to the, to the next talk. And let's thank again uh, Wojtek.
So the next talk will be given by Krzysiek Wawowski and he will talk about his ultra cold news. Okay, the stage is yours. Okay, so welcome again. Uh, this is our group. Actually, there are a few groups. Uh, the leader of the topic is Professor Kazimierz Rzewski, but also we have well, myself, uh, Viktor Pergamenszczyk, Lechmankiewicz, Michał, uh, two PhD students and postdoc, and some students who are collaborating with us. Uh, this is a very important topic uh, because we have uh, Topics Director, CTP Pass Director, and Chairman of Scientific Council. Concerning funding, uh, we have quite a lot. So Michał Matuszewski was, uh, joined CFT last year, and he's well, formally attached to our topic. He brought also three uh, European projects. My group is financed from Sonata BIS, but uh, we are doing also some popularization, and that's why you have also project from Ministry of Science and Education. Uh, Professor Żerzewski has Opus, Victor is leader of Polonis Bis. Uh, concerning publications, actually I'm quite proud that I managed in my, my group to publish physical review letters. I'm proud because it was like the first paper published uh, without well, big friends, let's say, based on, on our research. Uh, but, well, the old people were publishing a lot, uh, you know, mostly on the level 140 points. Uh, we also build this device over here. This is the machine to demonstrate uh, crypto cryptography, quantum cryptography, precisely BB84, just a demonstration. Uh, Maciek Marciniak was coordinating science festival. With this machine, we're doing a lot of popularization, supported by, well, Jacek Szczepkowski played a very important role. He's from the Institute of Physics. And Kuba wrote uh, also Delta article. Actually, Kuba cannot be here because he, right now uh, he's taking part in the competition for the uh, best thesis set in French. It's the competition uh, uh, Mathes dans uh, uh, 180 second. <laughs> so my thesis in 180 seconds. And I decided not to speak about all papers. I just selected one. Actually, uh, two of our papers were distinguished by science in Poland portal. Ah, it's so a bit annoying. Okay, this and this. But this PRL paper uh, was discussed actually a year ago. That's why I decided to speak about uh, this physical review A paper, Super Tongue Zero Do, uh, which, well, it was popularized by the now science in Poland with a very strange title. Uh, I don't know, cheated atoms, something like that. And what's about? <clears throat> well, with this selected topic, you will have a grasp what you are doing. So usually you are working on atoms, neutral atoms. Uh, I'm working on dysprosium, chromium, erbium. Wh why these ones? Because these atoms, uh, they should have something in common. They have a uh, strong permanent magnetic moment. What means that they interact even if they are far away. So they are neutral, still they are interacting uh, via non-local forces. Uh, what conditions are we interested in? So we are studying these gases but in temperatures which are very very low, like 100 nanokelvins, and these gases are very diluted, so you have to take the pressure around us or density around us and divide by 100 thousands. Why these conditions? Well, because in these conditions, uh, we can see the matter nature of atoms. So these atoms, they form matter waves. What's also funny, you can tune the interaction between atoms using external magnetic field. And recently it was discovered, and this motivation for my group, it was discovered that there are some new phases of matter which are emerging in the system, precisely so-called uh, quantum droplets, some quantum liquid. It was unexpectedly observed in 2016. Uh, and it's interesting because and it was not, well, predicted before, because uh, it's stable and appears mainly due to uh, quantum correction. So quantum fluctuations in the system, which usually are neglected, but, but 
in some regime, they turn out to be very important. And uh, I'm working mostly on the system in quasi one dimension. So if these atoms are squeezed to a very elongated tube, uh, because in this system, you can study strong correlations. You have a bunch of theoretical methods to study the system, like ab initio methods based on, well, um, exact diagonalization or DMRG, matrix product states time, uh, TDVP. Uh, you have in hand mean field approximations. For small number of atoms, you can do some analytics. Uh, so the paper I was discussing was based on this particular Hamiltonian. It's a simple model, so-called extended Bose-Hubbard model for the system. Uh, when you have first term is a tunneling term, the second is interaction for atoms being in the same position. So short range forces are here, and these long range forces are, are here. This is a lattice, one of lattice models. That's why. Uh, this box for X because uh, for the uh, author of that popularizing paper, it was a reminiscence of this uh, lattice, which actually is just a computational tool here. Okay, we can solve this Hamiltonian. We're interested in strongly interacting regimes when atoms are strongly interacting if they are in the same position. You see here actually a very simple matrix element. So we have a number of atoms in Jth position j and j times and j minus one over two is just number of pairs each pair is bringing some interaction energy u so this is the interaction energy for atoms in the same position if you take this u very large and look at the ground state you can discover uh, this phase diagram which is on the right so if this v is negative we are looking for liquids so we'd like to have forces which are repulsive if atoms are close by, but they are keeping them together in some distance, if they are in some distance. And, uh, well, you can find three phases, gaseous one, uh, liquid, and so-called self-bound mode insulator. The self-bound mode insulator is a very intuitive one. It's happening if uh, the, at the attraction between neighboring atoms is so close that the atoms would like to stick together one next to the other to minimize the energy and then uh, as a result we'll have exactly single atom per lattice size this kind of states are uh, well they are easy to obtain in experiments since uh, many years and what was the topic of this paper so we have these three phases three possible phases gas, liquid, and this mod insulator. And we ask the question, what will happen if suddenly we quench the interaction? So change the interaction from something very uh, repulsive to something very attractive. So at the end, after this quench, all forces between atoms will be only attractive. So naively, we would expect that these atoms will cluster somehow. They will, I know, form some solitons or Maybe there will be some collapse of, of the cloud. And this is not what is happening. So if you do the simulation first, starting from these three different states, and look at uh, how the density is changing in time, you will see that if you started with a gas, it remains a gas. Actually, nothing is changing in the dynamics. The same for this well, self-bound insulator. For the liquid, instead of collapsing, it's expanding. So this is what we found. First in numerics, and then we had, well, analytical solutions for two atoms, exact numerics with DMRG methods for quantum physics is, and many body methods is possible, up to eight atoms. And for a large number of atoms, you have to invoke some approximations, but all of these approaches were consistent concerning the uh, qualitative behavior, but also quantitative boundaries between uh, these phases and, and their uh, unexpected behavior. Why actually it's happening? So first of all, why gas remains a gas despite the fact that atoms would like to attract each other? Uh, well, it's not so easy effect. It was found by Girardot in 1936 that if interaction between atoms is very large, then the atoms, even if they are bosons, they what's called fermionize. So their ground state is exactly the same ground state as for, for fermions, if you take modulus of, of this. And because of that, because of Pauli principle, the two atoms cannot be in the same position. So despite the fact that the interaction energy is very attractive, 
the atoms will not fall into each other because they do not see each other. And it turned out that for fully attractive system, there is highly excited state exactly equal to the ground state of fully repulsive system. So we are jumping from the ground state to some other excited state, moreover being quite stable. And practically the same is happening for this bound mode insulator. If you have exactly single atom per lattice site, so even if you allow the atoms to, well, gain some energy because of energy conservation, because these atoms were anyhow in different position, nothing is changing in, in time. The most unexpected was actually this behavior of liquid, when we have proved that the liquid phase, if you jump to all attractive forces, is the wave packet of scattering states. And as every wave packet of scattering states is just dispersing and, and it looks like evaporation. And that's it. So uh, I summarized our topic, one result. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? So maybe I would have one question concerning the mean field methods. So if you get the, I don't know, ground state energy or something, so how do you certify uh, that, the, you know, how close this, this energy is to the, to, the, to the exact one? Are there any methods to bound the, the distance between the energies or the, the ground states? Well, for in this mean field, this ground state is it's like density functional theory, so you cannot really compare the ground states. Concerning energy, these eight atoms, it sounds maybe funny for you that uh, we can do numerics just for eight atoms, not so many. But uh, we have to know that uh, quantum many body dynamics is very difficult to, uh, to study in numerics, and eight is quite large, that's one thing. And the second, if you look at the energy per atom in quasi one dimension, we we'll see that it differs from continuous limit by less than 1% already for six atoms. So this eight in 1D is very close to, to infinity in some sense. So uh, if you look at uh, some quantities divided by the number of atoms, they are very, very f close to the uh, thermodynamic limit. Uh, that's why we could compare the energy and also the phase diagram for mean field and for exact numerics for eight atoms, and they look practically the same. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank Shik again. And let's move to the no next talk, which will be given by Bożena Czerny. She will report the achievements of the astrophysics group. Okay, thank you. So I have a, I have a pleasure to uh, present results from astrophysics uh, group and astrophysics group uh, consists of two sub parts, I would say. Uh, Part is led by me, part by uh, Agnieszka Janiuk. Uh, Ag uh, Agnieszka Janiuk chairs the uh, topic. And uh, Agnieszka is in Prague, so I'm presenting the results. And as this is, uh, I start with my, uh, my group. You can see here a number of people. But my group is already shrinking. As you can see, so soon I will have only two collaborators. I'm looking for a new ERC postdoc right now, and I continue to have one PhD student. So uh, on the other hand, Agnieszka's group uh, will uh, develop. So I will start with short introduction on, on uh, her results. So we both are mostly uh, doing uh, uh, general astrophysics, but uh, for sources which contain uh, black holes. So uh, sometimes we publish something in common. You can, s ah, I should point here, right? So we have one, one paper together, otherwise uh, Agnieszka uh, publishes more on uh, compact sources. It's not. Okay. 
Przesunąć. So this is a short uh, summary of, of most in, interesting uh, results from uh, Agnieszka. You see that she is not only doing numerical uh, computations, but she is also uh, interested in uh, data analysis. And as, as I said already, uh, the group of Agnieszka will uh, uh, increase soon because the most important thing is that she now got two new uh, grants, Maestro Grant and Marie Curie Fellowship. So her group will be really big quite soon. Uh, my group is shrinking, but still we are quite producing results and I, I listed only refereed publications and one of those papers was published in, in science so I will, I will talk shortly about this paper. So my work never starts with Hamiltonian or Lagrangian and actually it never finishes with Hamiltonian or Lagrangian. Our methodology is completely different so we uh, look at the sky, we observe interesting objects, we, we use our knowledge of physics to interpret this and it usually works, you can be surprised that it works, but it does somehow. So this paper uh, in science was of uh, this type uh, paper. The object has a name, maxi, whatever, whatever the number, and it was observed, uh, it was uh, detected uh, with the instrument on International Space uh, Station. Why this object was uh, interesting? It appeared on the sky all of a sudden in 2018. The object is located towards the galactic center, but it's closer than the galactic center, so it's a galactic object. It contains uh, more or less a 10 solar masses black hole, 8 actually, and the companion star, as this is a binary system, the companion star is slightly evolved sun, I would say. And there is a flow of material from the companion star uh, towards the, the black hole and this is uh, uh, outbursts in the, in the accretion disk are causing this uh, rise in the source vi visibility. So what, what uh, we did? Uh, we did not discover the, the object as you noticed, it was discovered several years ago already, and there were already 95 papers published about this specific object. But in astronomy, all the data is publicly available, so you can always go back to this data and analyze, analyze it again, and then see whether you can make something more intelligent out of it than the others did. And this is what, what, we, what we did. We went to the data, we analyzed the data again. We determined relative time delays between radio, uh, optical and X-ray emission. And the other two were our important contribution. We estimated evolution of the magnetic large scale magnetic field in the, in the source and we modeled numerically the outburst of the, of the disk. And that allowed us to conclude that in this object, for the first time, we see observational evidence that something like a, like a mad disk actually forms. Mad is magnetically arrested disk. But the acronym is nice. So you see, it's not just hand waving. We did some uh, uh, estimates of the of the magnetic field. There are some equations more or less describing that. As I said, we also uh, and that that estimate allowed us to 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 compare the estimate of the magnetic field with the criterion for the formation of this 
magnetically arrested flow when the flow stops really due to too strong magnetic field. And we also needed for that the time evolution of the of the accretion disk. So you do not see here Hamiltonian, but I even dropped several equations because you know that they were not they could not be placed on the, on this screen. So there was quite a lot of different work which was involved. And this is the scenario which we claim in this object. So at the beginning, the accretion disk is optically thick, geometrically thin, and large-scale magnetic field is fairly uniform. And then when there is an outburst, an inner hot flow forms, and the accretion rate and accretion velocity is here much higher, so the uh, magnetic field accumulates and then finally it accumulates so much that the mm, uh, magnetic field is too strong and slightly prevents and delay the accretion and then finally the the, the release of the of the jet uh, happens after that state so uh, what was my contribution to this uh, paper well, the, 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 the leader of the paper was Bay, uh, and he was a postdoc in Poland for three years. And that, at that time, I collaborated with him. And then he even visited uh, uh, CFT shortly before pandemia as, as a visitor. Uh, then uh, there were a number of people involved in data analysis. I will not stress them. Then there were people uh, responsible for theoretical part. Jean-Marie Omery is the author of the code, numerical code, which was used in this paper. And actually, he, he helped to perform all those computations. Me and Marek Sikora, mostly Marek Sikora, were uh, working with the magnetic field evolution. Piotr Rzycki helped with the time delays. So I was mostly help giving moral support, but still I think it was quite crucial for the paper to, to be published. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? There was no Hamiltonian, I know. And there will never be. <laughs> I think at some point I will have to give a lecture on seminar about specifically how we work in, in astronomy, why we don't have Lagrangian Hamiltonians, and then how we cheat on all this knowledge. And I will have a question to you how it is that in astrophysics, magnetic field is able to perform work, despite the fact that it shouldn't. Okay, I think that, that would be very good. I uh, also never use Hamiltonians in my work, so um, <laughs> we are on the same side, I would say. Okay, any other question? So let's thank Bozena again for, the, for her nice talk. And let's move to the last uh, talk of, this, of the first part of, the, of our uh, reporting session, which will be given by Lech Mankiewicz. And he will report news from science and society topic. And he will make some experiments as well. Uh, well, uh, I will report about uh, science and society uh, on behalf of Łukasz Turski and also a part of 
partially of myself. As formally, as you saw, I am uh, associated with another group. Uh, Lukas couldn't come here. Mm -hmm. And? No, it's not working, apparently. Okay. Yes, very good. No. Ten, ten is okay, tak? No, dobrze. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, Łukasz asked me to convey a very important statement which you can read by yourself. This is uh, really uh, extremely important. Most of you probably uh, present in the audience don't, don't uh, know this story, but uh, uh, Warsaw has a science center like many other European cities. And this is so-called Copernicus Science Center. And it was the first science center built in uh, Poland. And the person behind the whole idea and is its realization was uh, Professor Łukasz Turski. And he worked on it for many, many years. The, the, the idea was conceived in his mind long before any official statement that such a construction is considered politically uh, uh, was made. Uh, Maybe it comes at no, no surprise to you that that was a political decision. That was a completely new approach to presenting science, education, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Poland, just after gaining independence, had a lot of uh, other problems uh, to solve. And yet, Łukasz, uh, due to his ingenious uh, political capabilities, was able to convince the basically politicians from any part of political spectrum that such a construction is necessary. And that has been enormous success, enormous success. And now I think there's about 10 science centers scattered all over Poland and another maybe three or four in construction and many new science centers are being built in Central Europe, and that in a sense probably can be traced to the initiative of uh, Łukasz. Uh, and then for uh, uh, many years, he was the chair of the program council and uh, decided last year not to, uh, uh, not to continue basically uh, his duties. So this is uh, in the next uh, uh, period. So this is a, a very uh, crucial uh, statement. I think I have nothing to add to that. Now, uh, Ugas publications, as you see here, and uh, some lectures. Ukaš is genuinely interested in education and uh, has been also, has fathered within the Copernicus Center some uh, interesting ideas uh, about uh, a new approach of education. So, this is a very important contribution, uh, which is uh, maybe uh, which is definitely visible, but most people just take the existence of Copernicus Science Center and construction of new science centers in Poland uh, basically now for granted. I tell you, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, it didn't look that way, absolutely. Now, uh, my contribution to science at society is that I have been teaching physics and recently so-called non-computational math in elementary school, seventh and eighth grade. And here you see this school, 
Uh, I may maybe explain what does it mean non-computational math. A year ago, I asked myself why kids hate math, basically, and try to get them interested in something which is non-computational. I mean, our math program uh, focuses on recipes, how to basically add fractions. And there is, uh, you know, a beautiful math, even very simple, beautiful math, which is based on relations between various notions. If you, if you want such a problem, which is not computational, uh, assume that you have five people in the room, and among them there are at least two who know the same number of other people in this room. Think how to solve it. Uh, you don't have to perform any computation or, or, or considered fractions or something like that. And also, uh, teaching physics, I realized that uh, there is a lot of uh, things to improve. Our program, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, contains of 11 pages of instructions uh, what kids should know and uh, to realize in 100 basically 130 hours in two years for comparison the program of teaching english on the a2 level uh, which has uh, 150 hours uh, consists of 496 uh, uh, signs including spaces you see the difference right so i limited enjoying enjoying uh, enjoying uh, freedom I gain in this school, this is a private school, I limited the number of facts and increased the number of experiments. And basically for the whole seventh grade, at every lesson we meet with my students, we do some experiments and they do experiments as well. That's very important. So I have tabletop kitchen, uh, a tabletop experiment, which are very low cost, <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, such low cost that uh, school can afford to let every student to do it by my, by itself or himself right and uh, all this uh, in addition you pr probably know that i am a, a polish uh, a person responsible for polish version of khan academy so i am close to videos educational videos business and so I recorded every lesson for my students as a summary. After that, I recorded now more than 700 lessons altogether. And here is this, uh, here is this uh, example of another non-computational uh, uh, problem in, in, in mathematics. And uh, what I want to show you finally is uh, the uh, recent development you probably heard about uh, uh, you probably heard about uh, enlightenment right and the role enlightenment the epoch of enlightenment uh, 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 changes our view of uh, the, the the universe around us and uh, in in polish school and probably in all schools in the world uh, actually physics and uh, the sciences are completely split from huma humanities, although, of course, what happened during Enlightenment had profound influence on the development of civilization as the whole Western civilization. So, uh, in order to, <coughs> in order to uh, get it somehow together and have a common language with teachers of humanities, I collect objects like Roman art, for example, and here is a demonstration of a brahistochrone. And you know, brahistochrone is a curve of the uh, fastest, uh, fastest the uh, uh, descent. descent. Yes. The, 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 thank you very much. The curve of the fastest descent, and uh, because of uh, such an experiment, uh, we. I saw it maybe nowadays that would be more than 45 years ago at the physics faculty. And then in order to see the difference in time, the whole uh, installation is as, as long as the stable basically, right? Or maybe half of the stable. 
which is in practical in school, right? So due to, uh, we tried to, we, we decided to check whether that can be printed out and use as a tabletop experiment. And of course, the same problem of time resolution remains, but now we have uh, smartphones, which can record video with a very high time resolution. And this is, actually, I don't know whether it will work. Mm -hmm. Okay, because after clicking in this, there should be a video which opens. Yes, and, and, uh, very good, and now you will see or not. Uh, the left, the left path is the uh, uh, brachistochrone curve. This is this path, and you saw probably that it was the fastest one, right? As it should be. But, but, this is the final part of my. <laughs> you see here this similarly looking device, right? This is the brachistochrone path, and I have balls. We can check it in the break that actually this path is faster. Uh, apparently, uh, because of small perturbations, friction and things like that. And I saw even a simulation on the web, which was not done very carefully, definitely not by somebody who understood the significance on what he did. Because there is a numerical simulation uh, if a, of a, a paths which look similarly. And in this numerical simulation, also this path of this shape is faster. Okay, so if you have guts to consider it carefully, you know, in order to consider uh, friction, you need to consider curvature, curvature of this uh, path and so on, so on. This is be beyond my actual pos computational possibilities. But if you are deeply fluent in differential geometry, so to speak, and in one dimensional di differential or two dimensional to differential geometry, and can code it because that will have to be coded at, at the very end. I don't think there is, exists a, 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 a number, a analytical solution. You can tackle that, and that is going to be a, a, a really a material for a good paper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any question? Yes, of course. These are not perfect. These are 3D printed, right? If you if you feel them, they are not perfect, right? So there is a, there is a problem of starting the whole thing using such a primitive device. Uh, the brachistochrone starts from the uh, 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 vertical section, right? It's derivative in, in, in infinite at the at the top, so that cannot be uh, properly. Uh, uh, so there are many things you can perform your investigation. I am too old for that. I tell you today, it's my 65th birthday. But uh, but uh, if you like, I can give it for experimentation. You can play with it and write, a, perform calculation and write a good paper. Any other question? Okay, so if there are no uh, other questions, let me uh, say something about the Copernicus Science Center. <clears throat> so I encourage everyone to, to visit this place. I uh, often go there with my kids and I always enjoy the, the visit there. So if you have time and uh, you know, resources, please go there and, um, and see. So now we have time for the, well, it's time the, the proper time for the coffee break and we meet again at quarter to 12, okay? So I think we can uh, slowly start the second part of our reporting session. The first talk will be given by Mauro, who will tell us how to construct a piano. So thank you. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, the progress on the closer. Yeah. We'll be talking about the progress on the research group on Cartan connections and special contact geometries. So the research topic, which uh, was uh, used to be focused on Cartan connections and special contact geometry got extended as 
uh, conversation between Denson Hill, Adam Savitsky, Pavel Nurovsky, and Tian Rui Jean uh, got rise to a portion of this um, uh, a new topic in this, which is quantum information. And uh, as a consequence of uh, the um, conference that happened this summer in Warsaw, where Pavel um, introduced the new decaphonic scale, <coughs> we also became piano designer, we became interested in uh, music, but more on this later. So the research group has a part in uh, differential geometry with uh, Pavel Nurovsky, who is the principal investigator, Ian Anderson, Denson Hill, together with other researchers and postdoc to which I belong as well. Sorry? Loudly? OK. <clears throat> uh, then there is a part on quantum information, which is led by Adam Savitsky, uh, together with Bartosz Shirovsky and Piotr Dulian. And finally, the piano team, which includes Alexander Bogutsky, who's an experimental physicist and pianist, Andrzej Wodarczyk, Wodarczyk and, uh, who was a piano renovator and restorer, and uh, Leszek Mosher, as in the role of superstar, as he's a very renowned uh, pianist and uh, performer, composer. Uh, and of course, there are two teams of the CFT group, which is uh, Pavel and me. Okay, so uh, concerning the main activities in 2023, for the subject proper, we discussed uh, geometries of distribution, contact geometries, geometry with symmetries realize real forms of the simple exceptional Lie algebras, geometries on uh, uh, limit spaces in which null geodesics end. Then concerning the organization of uh, seminars, there was this uh, Greek seminar, which, is, which consisted in uh, seven mini courses uh, uh, that you can find this uh, link if the presentation will become available. Uh, and finally, we organized two conferences. Uh, there is uh, the conference I was mentioning before, which happened last summer here in Warsaw, Greek Meet Chopin, where the decaphonic scale was presented. And then there was this uh, second conference that happened a few weeks ago in Paris at the Université paris saclay which uh, used to be until uh, a few years ago and for three years in a row, the was considered the best place uh, for math in the world. And uh, finally, we extend our team with the two groups I mentioned, so quantum information and uh, music theory and experiment. Concerning publications, I will uh, show briefly these three papers by Pavel and, um, and collaborators, one worth 200 points and the other two worth uh, 140 points. Okay. Uh, now, the um, presentation of the decaphonic scale attracted the attention of the public media, Polish public, uh, Polish public media, and so we had a few interviews and uh, uh, articles in newspapers. There was one in Gazeta Wyborcza, one in Nauka w Polsce, uh, one in Rzecz Pospolita, and... <laughs> And uh, and then uh, radio interviews, one on program three and one of program two of the Polish national radio. Okay, now I'll be talking about the musical part of this project. Uh, so the aim of this part is to find a better tuning for the piano compared to the one we use. But uh, to talk about that, I should first talk about music. So what do we mean by scale? A scale is a selection of uh, uh, frequencies that we can use to compose music. Uh, and now I will start with the scale that um, prompted the whole uh, music theory, Western music theory, which is the Pythagorean scale. So how does it work? Uh, it's based on the physics of the vibrating string. So we take a string, we play it, and that's the, the first tone we start, the one that I denoted by one there. And every other tone will be uh, written uh, with the ratio of the frequency compared to this one okay so what uh, what the scale uh, how does how does the scale start so we take the string we vibrate it and then we fix the center point and we vibrate it again now the string is half the length with which means which means the frequency is doubled and it turns out that this sound sounds so harmonious compared to the first one that the human brain perceives it as the same note just a pitch higher so we call this uh, interval, this uh, interval which in music is the, means playing two notes at the same time, 
so this interval is called an octave and we will call the nodes that are distant by an octave um, with the same name. So there is this symmetry for which we can uh, uh, take any frequency and we can bring it in between uh, the ratios of one and two, but we can also take a frequency that is between these two and we can extend it uh, infinitely. So this is to be kept in mind. Okay, so now we still have one note because we have the same note repeated at different heights. So the next step is to do the, so we divided the string in two parts, now let's divide it in three. So let's fix instead the point that is uh, at a distance one third from one end of the string. So one part will be one third and the other will be two thirds, which means the ratio between the two is double, so it's the same note. And not only that, but uh, if we play this note together with the original tone, uh, it sounds uh, really harmonious. And so we would really like this note. So we put it in. Um, this is the ratio of, ratio of three thirds in between one and two. And this interval is called the fifth. So since the fifth sounds so pleasant to the human ear, uh we would like to include all possible fifths in a sense that to the point that it makes sense so we take the fifth and we build the fifth over the fifth so we multiply three halves by three halves we get nine fourths which is higher than two so to bring it back in between one and two we divide it by two and we get nine eighths which corresponds to the the second interval then we can take the fifth over this new fifth we get 27 16 and so on until we complete half of the scale for the remaining half we can do the same but in reverse so instead of multiplying by three halves we divide by three halves and completing the sequence this is what we get so this is how the 12 tones of the scale are born but uh, later people realize that uh, the human ear finds uh, an interval more pleasant if the ratio between the frequencies is a, a rational number whose nominator and denominators are really low because then uh, the beatings are not heard like the human ear perceives it more nicely so what people did was uh, to allow not only the factors of two and three to appear in the scale but allowing also the number five to appear and finding ratios which have much lower number, numerator and denominator in them that are close enough to the original tones. And these are the new fractions. And this intonation is called the just intonation. So this sounds uh, very nice. Every uh, interval or most intervals will sound pleasant to, to the ear. It has a problem though. The problem is uh, transposition. It doesn't allow for transposition. What is transposition? Um, it means uh, switch, uh, shifting the notes of a piece to a higher or lower pitch. Uh, why is it a problem? It's a problem in this scale, because if we take a piano that is tuned like this, uh, and we play a fifth, for example, uh, or another interval, if uh, we shift this interval, it doesn't have the same ratio. So it doesn't sound as the original one. It sounds like a completely different scale. And not only that, but it might also sound not pleasing enough. So that's a problem. Uh, that's a problem because it means that a piano has to be tuned in a different scale every time we play a piece that is in a different uh, tonality. So to solve that, uh, people came up with the equal temperament, which, uh, which uh, means uh, to subdivide logarithmically the ratios between one and two in uh, 12 identical parts. Uh, so it also means that uh, every note, uh, every note uh, will have a ratio with the following, uh, which is the same for every interval here. Uh, so the problem of uh, transposition is solved because now that the symmetry is complete, the problem is uh, if we look at the ratios, these are not even rational numbers, so there's no, they, they will not sound as pleasing as the just intonation. We can, uh, we have a way of visualizing the, the the notes because of this uh, symmetry by exponential symmetry by two. So the fact that doubling, doubling or halvening allows us to extend it to the whole scale, potentially to infinity, mm -hmm. means that we can uh, take the log logarithm of the ratios and uh, represent them on a circle because it has a periodicity. So we start from a frequency. This is a point on the circle. We take another frequency and this will be the angle at which we will have to draw the second note uh, 
the, the note with frequency f. And this is the visualization. We can see the comparison between the 12 equal temperament in red around and the just temperament, the just intonation, which uh, is uh, the green and blue one, where green and blue correspond to the piano keys, uh, the white keys and black keys. Okay, so now the question is, uh, can we do better than this? Can we do better than the 12, uh, 12 equal temperament? And uh, what do I mean by this? Like to translate more properly the problem, I want to find the natural number n for which the n equal temperament will have notes that are closer to the just to the notes of the just intonation. The advantage would be that we would get closer to the just intonation, <clears throat> so the, the sounds will sound more harmonious, and it will be an equal temperament, so it means that we can fully transpose it everywhere on the scale with, uh, without uh, changing the, the sound of the intervals. Uh, turns out that we can. So if we increase n uh, enough, uh, we we get uh, we get equal temperaments that are closer to the just intonation. And in this uh, representation, you see the first five, where each uh, each uh, temperament is uh, um, better than the previous one. And we see that as n increases, the the closer we get. And of course, uh, one could go on to infinity, could get and arbitrarily larger and we will get arbitrarily close to the just intonation but then we also have to build uh, a piano that has uh, way too many keys and uh, not only that but also play even if the piano existed we would have to play it and humans are limited in this so yeah this is the problem now uh, we can uh, change a few things so first of all uh, here we started from the note c and we build the just intonation starting from C uh, and the just intonation and equal temperament, but we can fix any other notes. So we have uh, 12 uh, possibilities. And uh, the, the question is, will it change? And the answer is yes, the result will change. And here you can see each line with a different color represents uh, the situation with a starting point at different notes. On the horizontal axis, you get the number of uh, subdivisions of the equal temperament. And on the vertical axis, you get the distance from the just uh, intonation. So we are basically interested in the local minima of these, uh, of this, uh, these graphs. And we can see that some are stable, but some are not stable and dependent on the original frequency. So this is, a this is a thing we can do. Another thing that's uh, useful to do is changing the metric. So what we are doing is considering the uh, average, average distance between the, the closest uh, tones of the just intonation. But we could uh, put weights on, this, uh, on these notes because some intervals might be more important than others. Like we, we might not care about the interval of a second, but we care a lot about the interval of a fifth or a third. So like, for instance, here we have uh, put uh, the first graph shows what happens if we put uh, value zero to the black keys, because we are mostly interested in the full tones rather than the, the alterations. And here we can see that already the minima are more stable as uh, there is uh, less variation. <clears throat> then we, we tried as basically for fun to see um putting random weights to see how the how this problem how the graph changes and it turns out that uh, some minima are still stable despite putting random random weights uh, especially the the 53 as you can see that's the the only one that is stable at uh, like no matter what uh, metric we put so it's a really good uh, sounding temperament okay this raises a question though what does it mean for a scale to sound good because uh, does uh, being close to the just intonation mean uh, sounding good? Yes and no. Yes, three minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Does it mean to sound good? Uh, we showed, uh, we put these uh, scales on an uh, electronic piano and showed it to experts. So pianists, uh, uh, comp uh, pianists, uh, uh, performers, piano tuners, and piano constructors. And uh, some scales, despite being close uh, with the average metric to the original scale, did not sound uh, as ple pleasing, pleasing to them, whereas some others did. So it's important to work with experts that can tell us what is necessary to preserve in a scale and, uh, and what's important to consider so that we can find good weights for this metric so that 
uh, we can uh, really understand what we are looking for. So project for, for the futures are, as I said, finding a good metric. So we will work with uh, musicians, piano tuners and piano makers to try to understand what's important in a scale. And finally, we'll have to build the piano and overcome the challenge of uh, putting extra keys uh, in a place that is already quite tightly packed. So thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? You say a uh, good sound for human being. Like, uh, how come actually all human being actually feel the same good sound for whole history of a human in the human history? The... Because I mean, if different actually region at different time, maybe human being may feel different uh, uh, good sound. So how come it is possible? That is true. Like it's very cultural dependent. Uh, in fact, uh, this is um, let's say this is mostly uh, Western music theory. But uh, the physical reason for the for which the octave, for instance, is such so fundamental is that uh, uh, in most um, so the reason why these frequencies sound harmonious and I should say harmonious rather than pleasing because pleasing is a very subjective term, whereas harmonious can have a physical meaning. And in particular, in this case, it means that, uh, so if we play a string, uh, <clears throat> if we had that perfect string, it would just play the, 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 the ideal physical string will just play one frequency. But uh, the fact that we are playing it with a finger, which is not uh, infinitesimally small, and the fact that it's a physical string uh, makes it so that there is some uh, perturbation to it. And the per perturbation causes overtones to rise. And the overtones will happen precisely in correspondence of the octave intervals, the fifth interval, the third interval. So all the intervals that, according to music, to, to the Western harmony, sound pleasing. So this is why I would say this is the physical reason why it sounds pleasing, why these uh, intervals sounds pleasing, sound pleasing. No, 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 because people on Zoom. So you mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I'm sorry, I was a little bit late, that you have some connections to the quantum information theory. So yes. would you elaborate well, on that? Not personally, but... Uh, no, 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 but I mean, I mean the group. So would you elaborate on that? Like, well, what's that? Uh, I know very little about it, but I think it has to do with the relation between uh, projective geometry and entanglement. I know very little about it, so <laughs> I can't say much more. Okay. But you sit too far. So this is basically uh, finding some connection between the uh, description of correlations in uh, systems of many fermions uh, and uh, some uh, theory of spinors. Okay, thank you. Sounds very different from what I said, but. <laughs> in, in human history and in different cultures, do we have different octaves? Octaves, I don't know, but we for sure you have see, different scales. Why I'm asking you, because you starting something new. Now look at the different culture. If all of them, I lived in many, many countries. I, I, I like lots of different absolute music, but I think that you can play this music in terms of on, the, on just on piano. If it's Korean music or uh, Arabian music, you still, <coughs> then the question, natural question is over the history, we have different culture. They have not been interacted and in interacting for you know, for thousand years, they still have the same octava, same. It's not necessarily, actually. Like Indonesian okay, if, music if has not, a different system, and the same Indian music. Like all right, then I want to ask you then, if there are different 
how it's connected with your uh, project. Did you, you know, how to say, consult different way? <coughs> for uh, <coughs> for this project, the aim is mostly to get as close as possible to the to the Western musical scale. But the other project of Babylon, the theme was about the the ten uh, subdivision, which has a completely different idea in mind and. Uh, if you hear it sound, the, the sound will not sound the same as uh, the Western model. It will, be, it will sound very um, disharmonious, I would say. So there, the, the idea is precisely that because different cultures can have different, uh, different systems, we can introduce a new system. This project is different. This project is just uh, trying to maximize the harmony. We didn't consult with other um, with experts from other um, systems, precisely because now we are trying to get as close as possible to the best uh, system according to the Western musical theory. So it would be interesting, though, for sure, to to hear what they what they find interesting. Because, for instance, we showed the thirty one scale to to um, piano performer, a, a pianist that. Uh, is uh, specialized in ancient music ancient music so working with the uh, tunes that are not the equal temperament so they they tune their their piano to the just intonation it's not even a piano it's a harpsichord uh, they tune their harpsichord to the just intonation and he found uh, the 31 scale not only closer but uh, more interesting in a sense because uh, it introduced introduced some uh, intervals that were interesting like he said i could work on this like this introduced a new taste like a slight variation from the original one with a new taste that uh, he said that this could be good like i could build something about this well just just summarizing i think it, it would be really very interesting to see how uh, this kind of uh, music theory works for example in china i think their sounds are quite different on the other hand in japan uh, chopin music is very popular so they apparently by nature like that i'm not sure about china maybe there is a difference between china and japan I have no no idea what about Korea, but uh, might be interesting just to check for curiosity. It just happens that I know how to overcome the technical challenges, not for constructing, but for playing the piano, namely to practice at least several hours a day. This is a big challenge. <laughs> we have to be more hours for more keys, so <laughs> be a lot of time. Yes. <laughs> okay, any other question? Regarding the technical problems, there was a Russian composer named Vishnogradsky who composed pieces for two pianos tuned uh, half a step ah, apart. And this way he got 24. Uh, no, but there are some keyboards with the. Uh, a lot of keys like uh, someone realized the harpsichord with 31 keys the difference there is that the harpsichord only has one string per note whereas the piano has uh, one for the lower notes but uh, three for the, the higher ones so the space in the piano is uh, already challenging but people can do it with more layers can do it like there are techniques and there so is so ancient harpsichords, harpsichords sometimes had double keys in, in some places okay as but then it's know. okay okay i guess uh, some finely tuned ones because it doesn't hit right it uh, plucks and so you need very precisely violin is the definite solution violin has a completely different capabilities a continuum of frequencies okay so thank you for the for uh, all the nice comments and questions and let's thank mauro again for for his nice talk very inspiring i'm going to learn how to play piano now so the next speaker is Oskar Sovik. And he will tell us about the universality of gates, of quantum gates. Good afternoon. 
so I will be talking, presenting uh, topic seven, quantum computing, topology and geometry in quantum mechanics. Uh, so the leader is Professor Savitsky, implementers Professor Białynicki and Professor Oshmaniec. Here is the composition of the of both groups, uh, quantum math group and quantum group. And I'll start with a brief summary of publications for 2020 and 24. So here are the publications by Professor Biula and Professor Savitsky for publications, five publications. And Professor Oshmaniec, five publications and eight preprints. So in total, within these topics, there were 14 publications and eight preprints. And the title of the talk is Efficiency of Universal Gates. Uh, I'd like to mention that our group, uh, the quantum group, uh, is now larger because uh, we have a new postdoc, Oliver Adam Smith, which is here, and also a new student from FUF, uh, Bartosz Sikorski. So I'll start with a motivation. Uh, as we know, we are currently having very imperfect quantum computers, which are called noisy intermediate scale quantum devices, and they are characterized by low number of qubits and moderate gate fidelities. And on such computers, quantum work correction is impossible, and the depth of circuits is very limited. So it's natural to ask about the questions about the depth of the circuits, um, not only because it's mathematically interesting, but it has some relation to, uh, well, technology. So the depth um, of the circuits depends on the efficiency of universal sets of gates used in the computation, and they can be bounded using, as I will recall, the solovay kitaev theorem. But on the other hand, there's another way of um, of looking at the depth via so-called uh, spectral gap, which is certain quantity denoted gap RS, which gives us um, kind of similar than solovay kitaev uh, relation, which involves the gap. Thus the description of this gap provides information about the efficiency of universal gates, and it quantifies the quality of so-called approximate T-designs, and I will dis dis describe what the T-designs are and uh, the spectral gap itself, but let me first uh, continue with the introduction. So it's, it's beneficial to think of quantum gates as, as, as group elements and consider words built from uh, alphabet, which is the alphabet of the fundamental operations, uh, universal operations. So this is usually SU2 or an SU4, and more complex quantum operations are just words over some fixed alphabet. Now, um, if our if our universal set if not, if our set of elementary operations is universal, then it guarantees that any quantum operation, for example, the black dot here, can be this. Um, epsilon approximated by a word built from uh, universal operations uh, with some finite length. So if we imagine that the, the dots here, the red dots here are, are our initial universal operations, then by considering words built out of them, uh, we are guaranteed to land in an epsilon ball within any operation, desirable operation. This just means that the set S is universal. So the question we are asking is, uh, what is the length of words we need to use to approximate uh, our quantum operations? And we know also the Vaikitaev theorem, which is a very well known uh, statement about this L, which tells us that uh, if S is universal, then for every quantum desirable quantum operation, this is the length of words, which guarantees that, that uh, our set is so-called epsilon net, so it covers epsilon balls. Uh, uh, within all those operations, they cover our group, which is equivalent to the previous statement. Um, now let me introduce another object, which is approximate T-design. So 
our, quant our initial set of quantum operations, universal operations. It defines some discrete measure on our group. And um, for this measure, we can define the t-moment operator, which is the following operator. So basically, it will be, because this is discrete, it will be just a sum uh, over, over our elements. And the spectral gap is the difference between the t-moment operator and uh, for our discrete measure and the Haar measure. And basically, it is the discrepancy between kind of averaging. Um, in fact, it means that it is a discrepancy between um, averaging uh, polynomials um, of degree t on a group with respect to our Haar measure and by evaluating on discrete a number of points. And if this discrepancy is zero, then we say that the sum, the, our finite set of operations is exactly designed, which means that in terms of averaging over the group, it is equivalent to the Haar measure, which is very useful. Of course, up to some uh, polynomials uh, of bounded degree t. So the spectral gap here is the measure of quality of our approximated, uh, and of course it's, it's louder than one, but, uh, but uh, smaller than one. Uh, but then uh, we can say that this is some kind of approximate design, so it's not ideal, but uh, kind of uh, approximates the hard averaging. And the spectral gap here is the measure of quality of approximate design and also the efficiency of S, which can be shown. So it has a relation to the, 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 well, the depths of quantum circuits. And maybe I'll just mention that unitarity designs uh, have various applications, uh, for example, in quantum information protocols, uh, very known, applica known applications in uh, randomized benchmarking, shadow estimation, and also detection of entanglement, and randomization, and things like that. Um, so there is a theorem which um, I mentioned uh, in the introduction, basically, if we know the, the the spectral gap at some finite scale, then we can bound the uh, the length of the circuits as follows. And we had two objectives: first, to find explicit bounds on on the gap at some finite scale, and to improve the scaling of epsilon with t, which is here. This scaling comes from some relationship between t designs and epsilon nets, with, with, which has been found by Holodetsky, Savitsky, and Oshmanets, and basically by trying to improve the scaling, so improving the relationship between epsilon and t designs, we can try to get better bounds on this efficiency. And in terms of objective one, there is a theorem by Vario, which gives us a polylogarithmic decay of the gap. But the problem with this, uh, with this statement is that the constants are unknown, and we as a physicist would like, really like to know the values of constants. Um, so the natural question which arises here is, can we get a polylogarithmic lower bound with calculable constant? And the answer is yes. And you can see our paper where we give explicit polylogarithmic lower bounds for generic universal sets with some mild assumptions. And it's we can be calculated on existing supercomputers, at least for a qubit and some bounded T, let's say up to a thousand, but experimentally, um, this is quite high. And now about the current work, so basically objective two, uh, we are trying to apply approximate identities on groups to epsilon net and T design correspondence to improve this scaling. And we obtain instant bounds from Fezzer kernels by considering Fezzer kernels on PU2 and show that Fezzer kernels correspond to a certain function, uh, which is used in the proof of the theorem by Vario I mentioned about this about this decay of the gap. And we reproduced optimal in T scaling between epsilon and T for PU2 using heat kernels. And right now we are trying to generalize our results to PUD and attempt to obtain better scaling in D, which is crucial because this uh, scaling in T is already optimal. Um, and a summary. So the description of spectral gap is an interesting mathematical problem, but it also uh, has relevant applications in quantum computing in uh, this, like saying something about the efficiency of universal sets of quantum gates and properties of approximate designs. 
Various kernels, including the heat and fissure kernel, can be employed to obtain uh, the good correspondence, mathematical correspondence between epsilon net and T designs. And we address two objectives. First, to find explicit bounds on the gap at some finite scale and find better epsilon net T design correspondence using some natural mathematical objects like heat kernels and other not kernels on groups. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your nice presentation. Are there any questions? So when you construct something bigger from these approximated uh, quantum gates, I understand that somehow the, the error propagates. And does it grow when you, when you create bigger and bigger and more complicated circuits or not? Uh, well, it's true that the error of the physical implementations of gates uh, quickly grows with the size of the uh, depth of the circuits, and this is the main major obstacle in NISCO, NISCO devices. But here we are considering a perfect operations. We're just asking about the efficiency of, uh, like, using ideal operations, like how many, op how how deep circuits are required to ensure to be able to implement arbitrary operation. Yeah. Actually, I had very similar questions, but would it be interesting to take into account these noises by considering operations, which is like in you know, estimation to it, some imprecise, uh, giving some uh, implicit imprecision, some smearness of that. And then naturally, if the word is very long, then the noise would be very large, and uh, one can uh, exclude two long words from the analysis, for instance. Do you think is is it possible actually to account for this? Honestly, I think uh, it's uh, not uh, like the best way to do here. But uh, because, um, well, I mean, perhaps you can restate this problem and. Uh, in a way that it will make be more appealing uh, as a research topic, I guess. Um, I mean, I don't see any any way to like incorporate errors into this. Uh, just this, this problem is already mathematically difficult as it is, and. You know, But it, I guess, it uh, requires further thought. Any other question? Okay. I have no idea what is PU2. I know what is SU2. What is PU2? Yes. So this is just a projective unitary group. <laughs> I don't know. So uh, yeah, we're just taking the quotient of SUD by ZD, so the central elements, and we get the projective group. Just the proper group of quantum operations because we don't care about the global phase, not only the norms, but also the phases. Okay, so thank you very much for, for your uh, nice talk, and I propose that we move to the next talk. And the next talk will be given by me. So hello everyone. <laughs> so I'm going to report the activity of my group. My task is non-classical correlations in composite quantum systems. I lead the quantum information group here at CFT. This is this was the this this were the members of the group uh, last year. So in the end, I had five postdocs again, and uh, well, they were coming, moving. So there there was a lot of somehow instability, let's say, uh, with respect to postdocs. I had also two uh, PhD students. Uh, one was virtual because he started to work for a, for a bank, but he, this year, at the beginning of this year, he managed to, to complete his, and defend his thesis. I also had five students. So this was quite uh, something to manage, uh, I would say, but two of them even prepared uh, their thesis with, uh, with the group. And in fact, one got so, I don't know, so like Ignacy 
got a bachelor with me at the University of Warsaw, but then he left uh, physics because uh, I don't know, maybe he was tired with the topic, or but he started to study medicine, which is something really regrettable. So what we do, we characterize well non-classicality in quantum system, let's say, and we also try to use this non-classicality for uh, providing methods to, to certify quantum states and quantum measurements. This is the these are the source of uh, fund sources of funding. We have three projects. One is uh, a personal project of uh, Sazim, uh, one of the postdocs in the group. And last year we also managed to to get uh, on board of the European project uh, called Next with the EU, uh, EU Hope on facility. So let let me now say a few words about this because yesterday I was on the on the on the webinar about Hopon facility, it's a it's a facility that allows you to join a European project very easily. It seems, and last year there were like nine applications from Poland, and eight of them uh, is going to be financed. So the success rate is very high. So it's a quite easy way, let's say, because the application consists of eight pages only. You have to find a, a project, European project that you can add to uh, yourself and. Uh, well, just submit your application. It seems it's very easy to to get uh, to get the you know the funds. Concerning publications, this is the the list of published papers and preprints. Let me just say here that the first one and the last one, there is some small chance that they will get published in PRL, which would be very nice. And I'm going to talk about this one, which is about the the generally entangled subspaces in the stabilizer formalism. I ch chose this one because I already had slides for the for the uh, for for the talk, but also because it uh, somehow relates this project relates to what I was doing when I was a PhD student. So there is some you no, know, I have some emotions related to 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 uh, to, to this uh, subject. Let me start from some uh, from some um, definitions. So let me consider a state consisting of uh, n qubits. We call this state uh, generally multipartite entangled if it cannot be written as a tensor product with respect to any B partition of N subsystems. So we divide N subsystems into two, two uh, disjoint uh, non empty subs, uh, subsets. If, if the state cannot be written as a tensor product of states corresponding to those subsets, then we call it generally multipartite entangled. So this is the most precious form of entanglement, let's say, in the multipartite uh, case. This definition extends to the to the case of mixed states, and here are the uh, the most para paradigmatic examples of uh, generally entangled states, like the Greenbergen Horn uh, Zeilinger state that you might know from from other from some applications like quantum cryptography. Okay, and now this notion can be extended to subspaces. So we take again the NQD Hilbert space. We define a subspace in this Hilbert space. And then if every pure state belonging to the subspace is generally entangled, we say that this subspace is generally entangled too, because it contains only states that have this feature. And why I got interested in this problem? Because uh, it's uh, another way of uh, studying the separability problem of quantum systems. So once you have a, a subspace which is generally entangled, you know that every state acting on that subspace, every mixed state, will uh, also have this feature. And this also gives you a way of constructing such, uh, such states for some applications. Okay, and the questions that, that we wanted to address is how to verify that a given subspace is, uh, a given multipartite subspace is genuinely entangled. And of course, in general, this is a, a difficult problem because the, the separability problem is, uh, is NP-hard, it's known to be NP-hard. That's why we move to uh, the so-called stabilizers of spaces. And then uh, in the next slide, I'm going to explain what stabilizers, uh, sub stabilizers of spaces are. But there was the other question that uh, I think is uh, a bit more interesting, is whether there exists PPT entangled state in the stabilizers of spaces. And this, was, this, uh, this is related to the famous Paris conjecture that was already disproven in these papers here by, by Verteji and uh, Verteji and Brunner in two papers. So this was already 10 years ago. But what they, what they did, they provided examples of PVT entangled uh, states that violate bell inequalities. But the violation was very, very little. And I somehow saw that the, there might be a possibility to get examples that would violate bell inequalities uh, maximally. And this question, well, it doesn't have any meaning to you 
but it's like comparing resources in quantum information. So you have states that have different forms of entanglement, and you like to know whether these states uh, can give rise to, to Bellman locality and then be useful, for instance, for uh, some applications in the device independent uh, framework. That's why I was thinking, okay, this formalism, the stabilizer formalism, maybe uh, might be a very good place where you could uh, try to find this, this kind of states. Okay, concerning the stabilizer formalism, so we consider again n qubits. We consider the Pauli n qubit Pauli group, which is uh, which consists of uh, n-fold tensor product of Weyl Heisenberg matrices, which are given here. So these are the powers of x and z operators that generalize the the standard Pauli matrices, the qubit ones. And then you consider a subgroup in this group generated by a finite number of, uh, of elements of the Pauli group, uh, they have to satisfy these two constraints, so they have to commute, and they, they cannot give rise to identity multiplied by, uh, by this factor here, where om omega is the root of the, of, of the unity. So if you consider such a, a subgroup, then it stabilizes a, a subspace in the whole Hilbert space, stabilize to stabilize means this, that the, every element of the subgroup when acting on the state from that subspace gives the same state. So it doesn't change the subspace. And this is the, so it's, I mean, it's a known fact that this, uh, this stabilizer would stabilize a non-trivial subspace in the sense that it has some dimension. Uh, and this stabilizer subspaces are useful. They are useful, for instance, for quantum error correction. But at the same time, they provide a very convenient description of, of a class of multipartite states, because instead of thinking of pure states and their uh, linear combinations, you just have to, you, you can think of the generators of the, of the uh, subgroup. And here is the, the, uh, one of the examples of the quantum error correction code. It's called the five qubit code because the, Hilbert, the underlying Hilbert space consists of five qubits. Here are the generators, where X and Z are just the Pauli matrices, and the subscripts denote the particles at which a given matrix acts. And uh, they uh, generate a subspace of dimension two, and these states can be used as the code walls for, the, for encryption of qubits. And then this, this is the minimal code that allows you to correct a single, single qubit error. Okay, and the results. So the first result is that we have a simple criterion to uh, verify whether a given stabilizer subspace is genuinely entangled. And it's, it's here, it's uh, under this theorem. So you have to take, the, you take the, the, um, the generators and you have to check that for every bipartition of all the parties into two subsets, there exists a pair of, uh, of generators for which the, the operators acting on one of the part of the, of the whole Hilbert space, uh, they don't commute. Okay, and here is the here is the explanation. What what is this GIQ? So GIQ is the part of the stabilizing operator acting only on the Q part of the whole system. And the second result is that we managed to prove that there are no PPT entanglement. There is no PPT entanglement in generally entangled stabilizer subspaces. So, I mean, we have a if and only if, uh, if fact. If you have a I mean a stabilizer subspace is generally entangled if and only if all states, all mixed states acting on that subspace are NPT, so they are detectable with, uh, with the aid of partial transposition for every bipartition. So it sounds quite strong because it means, it somehow almost means that there are no PPT entangled states, there is no bound entanglement in this uh, stabilizer formalism, but this is not, uh, this hasn't been settled yet, so we have to still work on this a bit. Okay, so this is the discussion. So this, this is where I was uh, wanted to get to. Uh, so well, so what I wanted to achieve is that maybe I would be able, or we would be able to find examples of uh, of uh, entangled states that are PPT or bound entangled that violate bell inequalities uh, maximally. And this is because we already have uh, constructions of bell inequalities for the for the stabilizer subspaces. So we are able, if we have a stabilizer subspace. For, at least for some of them, you are able to construct bell inequalities that are maximally violated by every state acting on that subspace. So it would, be, it would have to be nice to, to find uh, such examples of, uh, examples of such states, because then we could somehow solve the, the Paris conjecture in the, the maximal possible way. 
But at the same time, if these states do not exist, it might be that partial transposition, which is one of the main criteria for detecting entanglement in quantum states, is an if uh, and only if criterion for separability for, for this kind of states. So you see, this is a win-win scenario. I mean, either we provide an example of such a state, then we have maximal violation, perhaps maximal violation of abelian equality. If we can prove that such states don't exist, partial transposition would detect all entanglement in this uh, formalism. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> So concerning the first point, when you are looking for maximal violation of Bell inequalities, uh, are you trying to get all of that at once? So do you consider um, uh, any amount of uh, particles or do you leave it yourself to like a small spaces? So uh, for the stabilizer formalism, uh, I mean, if you to consider two particles, you have only one state, which is the maximally entangled state. Uh, then for three, there are no, I think, generally entangled subspaces. You have to start from four qubits in order to have something non-trivial. But that something non-trivial can be easily checked because it's a very simple system. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that we are trying to prove it now. <laughs> I'm trying to convince my people to, to do this, but the, the problem, well, it's not so easy, I would say, okay? So, yeah, but, uh, but one of the approaches was to use SDP to, to find, uh, to take some subspace that you know and try to find bound entanglement there. And we haven't found any, so we were thinking that maybe this is the, the place where you can prove that uh, partial transposition detects all entanglement. Oh, sorry, I think I just missed this along the way in the slides, but was your, your nice um, if and only if statement uh, for systems of qubits or qubits or, or what? Qubits, okay, it's for everything. Oh, right, cool, nice. Uh, so thank you for the questions. So I think we can now move to the next talk. So the next speaker is uh, Gursha Ranjit, uh, our PhD student who will uh, tell us the news from the uh, computational uh, cosmology group. Hello everyone, I am Gursha Ranjit and I'm a PhD student in computational cosmology group here at Center for Theoretical Physics. And yeah, I'll be, I'll be telling about science and achievements of our group during the last year. So these are the members of our group, Wojtek and Machi, these are the PIs, and our postdocs, Mariana, Priyanka, Oliver, uh, Krishna, and Maria Luisa. Uh, Krishna left and Maria Luisa also leaving. Uh, and doctoral students, Suhani, she submitted her thesis. Uh, Pavel, Feven, Anjita, and Gursharanjit, which is me. And we also had some uh, in, interns and project students working with us. And the biggest achievement of our group during this year that Sohani submitted her thesis and she's the first PhD uh, of our group and she and she received mostly positive reviews and one was also suggesting distinction and her defense is planned for May 15. And another big thing we did was that we PhD students, we organized a summer school uh, named Precise and it was a very successful summer school with international uh, instructors and uh, tw around 20 participants and we published around 12 leading author papers uh, mostly uh, with most of them submitted to PRD and some to MNRS and apart from that uh, we were also the group members were also part of other papers and uh, and there were many papers with uh, large collaborations where we had significant roles and our group members won three grants four people won three grants and we attended a lots of international conferences and presented our work there and apart from precise our group was in, uh, significantly involved in organizing committee of various meetings like european astronomical society lsst poland meeting and, and we actively participated in science outreach activities 
and uh, uh, I remember Oliver's research uh, about uh, dwarf, uh, dwarf galaxies uh, got uh, covered by press, and this is one such coverage by uh, physics.org. Uh, okay, now coming to science. So what our group is doing it, uh, we are trying to answer, uh, some, some people of our group are trying to answer two very hot cosmology question, that is, is, is general theory of relativity valid at all scales? And second, what is the reason behind the accelerated expansion of the universe? And a part of the group does it with the help of co uh, computational cosmological simulations, like Coco, uh, uh, for example, Sohani, she, she tries to find the differences if there uh, if there's a universe with gr and there's with non gr uh, theory of gravity modified theories of gravity then she tries to find the differences in the density uh, this is one such plot which is showing uh, the density contrast between a gr and a non gr model and uh, mariana Haber, she does the same thing, but uh, she checks the difference in the velocity fields. And then these are simulations in, in a box. Then Powell, uh, he steps, uh, he goes one step further, and he tried to create simulations which are uh, comparable to observations in a way that he tries to create uh, light cones from these boxes. And he tests the higher order clustering st uh, statistics for GR and non GR models. Next, uh, uh, Feven and Oliver, uh, they try to find what is the nature of the dark matter. Is it warm dark matter or cold dark matter? And they, and this is one plot showing such work. Uh, this is showing uh, how the number of satellite galaxy would be different in the universe with a cold dark matter or a warm dark matter model. And then, uh, uh, other part of the group, we work with observation because uh, to check that if uh, uh, how the universe actually looks, we need to make observations and then compare with the theoretical work that our other colleagues are doing. So, and uh, since uh, uh, the data, the observational data is huge uh, and we need lots of computational resources to look at them. So, a part of, so we are trying to really get on the machine learning bandwagon. Uh, to, to obviously it has computational advantages. So, uh, so large surveys are trying to observe galaxies, and uh, th uh, these are multi-million galaxy data sets. And to do the uh, to do uh, uh, status uh, clustering or uh, weak lensing studies, we really need to know what is the exact this. Uh, uh, position of the galaxies, uh, their relative distance to us, which we uh, in cost we define by redshift and. So, but uh, to uh, get the correct, uh, correct spectroscopic redshift, we, the, the, these are known by taking the galaxy, uh, spectra of a galaxy. And with these number of galaxies, it's very challenging to get uh, spectra of all, all of these. So, Priyanka Jalan, she is trying to look at the differences between the galaxies uh, that we have in imaging surveys. We are mainly working with kids. And uh, if uh, the, the same galaxies are observed in any of the uh, spectroscopic survey, like gamma. And as you can see from this plot, that there are fewer galaxies observed by gamma than by kids. And she's trying to find that, is there a particular reason why, that, why these galaxies are missing in spectroscopic survey? So then Anjita, she goes one step further. She says, I don't care if there, I don't care if there's no spectroscopic data. I will get the redshift just from the images of the galaxies. And she does it by uh, using uh, deep learning methods like convolutional neural networks. And this is uh, uh, the result of her approach. As you can see, the redshift uh, estimated by her just from the images is a bit comparable to the what we get we will get the redshift from a spectroscopic surveys and this and this is my work and i am uh, and we are planning to get new observations uh, from new uh, spectroscopic telescope foremost which will be hosted here in chile parallel observatory and my work is to uh, i'm part of the foremost waves group and i am involved in target selection for this survey foremost waves, which is a redshift limited survey and also uh, limited by the uh, brightness of the galaxy and we are going towards the fainter galaxies. 
and I uh, and I I use machine learning to find that that given the flux of the galaxy is this, should it be included in our target uh, targets or not? So this is a confusion metric of a test result, and as you can see, I we are getting 91% correctly and 95% shouldn't be there. We are also getting that correctly. Uh, there are 4% uh, of these contaminations creeping there, but my goal is to minimize these missed targets because we don't want to miss the galaxies that should be there and we don't want that uh, we miss them. So this is my work. Yeah. And this is my group. So yeah, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, quite at the beginning, you showed something like a map uh, with the departure, with the difference between GR and non-GR. Mm -hmm. And if I read the, uh, yes, that one, if I read the colors correctly, then you see those departures at the level of 100%. Is that correct? And if it is true, then it should be easily spotted. Or am I reading the, the plot incorrectly? Uh, this is Sohani's work, and I, uh, she'll explain better. Sohani, she's oh. there. Uh, yes, this is, um, yes, this is basically the difference between uh, these two. So it's not a fractional, but it's not a fractional, but it's like a subtraction between the density contrast, different between a modified gravity model and a GR. Does this address your question, Pajna? Okay, okay. Can you briefly explain? I, I can understand what is GR, but I don't, don't understand what is non-GR. What is everything? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so general theory of relativity. Uh, here we try to explain using Einstein's equation of uh, gravity. And there we have particular one, Ricky tensor. OK, this is going into. Okay, so maybe much you can explain it better <laughs> technically. Uh, sorry, because Gurshan doesn't really work on that aspect of our group, so I will very briefly explain. It's a bit misnomer. The, the idea here is that you try to include some, what in, in practice boils down to some kind of fifth force which is uh, can be expressed as some scalar field or something like that uh, which basically gives you some uh, effects for instance in uh, depending on local density or or uh, or local or, or but dependent on mass so for instance you can have in enhanced uh, structure formation in some uh, in where, where the density is larger that's uh, people usually call it modified gravity. The idea there is to yeah to you add some terms, for instance, uh, a function of the of the Ricci scalar in your equations. Um, it's it's a it's a large it's a large field of current research. So that's what we call here non-GR. But basically, it bo it boils down to GR in most regimes. But in some regimes, there is this extra term. Thank you for this nice explanation. Any other question? If not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. And I would like to invite Jarek Korbic to the stage. He will tell us about how to bound information in the environment. And luckily, he has only three slides. 
Thank you. So I'm the last one before, traditionally before you and pizza. So um, the second year in the row, I'm experimenting with a uh, absolutely minimalistic presentation. I try to avoid everything. Uh, this year, I permitted myself to have two formulas. Uh, if you don't like it, and if you want me to show on the bells and whistles, all the formulas and all that stuff, I can include it maybe in the next year. Now, the group is me, uh, Taihun Li, who is a PhD student, and Masaya Takahashi, who has been postdoc with us. Uh, there was a bunch of uh, um, uh, students also uh, working. Two of them, uh, two of them, sort of uh, stayed for longer. Tomek Bazelewicz from Warsaw University and Michał Szczepanik from Gdańsk University of, Te of Technology. Uh, we are doing a little bit of a uh, gravitational decoherence uh, uh, work with them. Uh, now, publications, we did not publish much last year. There is also a uh, very nice quantum paper, but since I reported it last year, I did not include it uh, 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 in this summary. But this year, we started with a PRL without big names and also PRA. So this year will be more productive, I guess. Uh, the group is financed from um, uh, Opus, where I am the uh, PI. Um, but uh, we also managed to get a Quantira, which is a very nice collaboration between uh, Czechia, two groups in, in Germany, uh, and uh, um, a group in Italy. And the collaboration is um, uh, experimental theoretical. So the, the, the Mark Asman from um, Technical University in Dortmund and uh, Andrea Curia are experimentalists. Mark Asman is actually working with Polaritons. Uh, Andrea Curie is a quantum optician, <clears throat> so we'll try to use, <clears throat> those of you who remember my talk last year, I was showing a very peculiar form of um, uh, teleportation where actually uh, the uh, decoherence coming from the environment can be used to uh, get rid of itself. So starting from that idea, uh, we uh, we sort of made a uh, extended uh, proposal together with Kasia Roszak, who is the leader, and uh, and uh, some people that you see. And there is also a preludium piece, uh, which I got for a for a PhD student for this year. Uh, okay, so I, I will present you the. How does it work? Okay, I will present you uh, the. Um, one of very nice result which we got, uh, which we got last year, and which took me with long breaks. It took me about I don't know seven or eight years to get there. Surprisingly, uh, so the the um, I I tried to use a sexy name, but unfortunately it didn't work in PRL. So uh, the actually name of the article is 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 different. Uh, but it is it is a um, some phenomenon which which seems very natural, but has not been surprisingly has not been studied. Uh, uh, sort of a bonding of information in the in the environment. So um, starting from the from the very uh, very fundamental level. So as you can imagine, everything uh, interacts with with something. Uh, and especially the more, so to say, the more quantum you try to be, the more of that interaction with the with the environment you you see. And this environment can be of different forms. This can be, for example, uh, vibrational modes on some solid state uh, substrates. This can be um, leftover of uh, air molecules in, in, in vacuum chambers, so it can be um, electromagnetic radiation which uh, which interacts with your system. So there is this outer, there is your system that, that you are interested in, and there is this outer world which is which is interfering. Uh, and we call it environment. The, 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 the main feature of the environment is that you could don't control it. So if you if you if you imagine that you have an I don't know an ion trap and then you have something uh, uh, some leftover ga gas uh, interacting with your ions and now try to imagine that you catch this gas up and you try to measure its state so forget about it 
so that's probably the, the best definition of the entire of environment. It's something usually big and something that you don't control. So this interaction, <clears throat> this um, interaction plus the lack of control of the of the uh, big amount of degrees, usually big amount of degrees of freedom leads to a suppression of quantum properties and this is called uh, decoherence so that's something opposite to coherence which coherence basically is linear superposing so that that is something that destroys linear that destroys the, the essence of quantum which is which is linear superposing uh, there must be of course quantum technologies in the in the slide so this is a huge obstacle in quantum technologies and uh, may i say that's the biggest obstacle apart from maybe some theoretical gaps but that's the in in practical implementations that's the the biggest uh, the biggest optical but this is an a uh, double edged sword so to say because at the same time so being a complete pain for 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 anyone who is trying to build a quantum experiment on the same time especially in the last i would say 15 to 20 years this theory of decoherence has sort of like quasi silently uh, rose to uh, the most reasonable and i would say sane explanation for uh, the quantum to classical transition so why we don't observe uh, uh, quantum features in 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 macroscopic world there have been a lot of uh, maybe not a lot but there the, the were um, uh, different proposals but this one seems to be like the most down down to earth and the most uh, the most reasonable that's why i'm interested in it in my general interest in quantum to classical transition and since this gives the most uh, in my opinion at least and probably not only mine this gives the most uh, the most reasonable explanation that uh, what i have been researching so the usual picture of the of the decoherence is that we have this environment which is which is uh, interacting with, with the system and the usual slang is that the environment is monitoring the system so monitoring this means that because of the interaction there is a correlation buildup there is a correlation buildup between uh, environment uh, and the system and even some people say that environment is learning something about the about the system and then since environment is uncontrolled you have you have no other choice as ignore it this is called uh, partial tracing in in uh, in uh, quantum jargon or quantum quantum language and this leads to the suppression of of quantum properties so then you can then you can ask okay so if uh, environment is learning something about the system so can we learn something from the environment okay so what environment so the natural question is if the environment was learning so what did it learn about the system can we get it out in principle yes i just told you that the environment is uncontrollable but of course this is not always uh, not always like that because the fact that you see me and that you hear me is because there is an environment photonic and and uh, gas environment that mediates between uh, light scattered of myself and your eyes and then and, and there is a air which mediates between my voice strings and your ears so you do catch a part of the environment in which for example i as a system am embedded of course you don't catch everything because the eye is only some solid angle times some 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 frequency uh, this is called indirect observation uh, so observation through the environment uh, it's common in everyday life, but uh, quite surprisingly, it started to be um, to be seriously analyzed only in more or less recent 15, maybe 15 plus years. Um, it was started mainly by or uh, reactivated mainly by by Wojtek Żurek and his group, and uh, it goes under different names of objectivity, quantum Darwinism. We had our own uh, little contribution here called spectrum broadcast structures. Uh, so the, the question is not uh, the question in a sense is not purely academic because it also puts some limits on like what is measurable indirectly okay so contrary to, to popular belief we show that not all that environment is learning about the system as measured by the power of decoherence let's say not all of that is extractable from the environment so some some of the uh, some of the information i'm using this term without much rigor 
I can say rigorously what, what I mean and, and, and hopefully I, you will understand. Uh, but uh, some uh, some of the correlations which which have been built up, so so there's some changes of the state of the of the environment that that was induced by uh, interacting with the system. Some of that is not recoverable. And if you think a little bit of it, well, you can imagine such a situation. If you have a thermal noise, then some of the correlations will be will be. Uh, will be lost or will be smeared or polluted, you, however you call it, by by thermal noise, and indeed, indeed this is this is what is happening. And the the effect is somewhat similar to what uh, Remig was mentioning: a bound entanglement. So entanglement that is uh, so noisy that uh, you can't extract it. Uh, you can't extract it. Uh, uh, locally. Here I'm not talking about entanglement, I'm not talking about the correlations, I'm more interested in, in a, say, a specific property of the system which I would like to uh, extract from environment since environment interacted with the system and I assume that learned something about the system. Okay, to be a little bit more precise, still no formulas here, to be a little bit more Yes, unfortunately, there are two, but, but um, I mean, if you don't like them, next time I can do without formulas. So, to be a little bit more precise, you have to take a model. You have to take a model where there is a system, when there is a, a big, uh, other big system, which you, call, which you call the environment, and see what happens, okay? So, one of such popular, um, uh, not to say one of the most emblematic models, is the so-called quantum Brownian motion model which is a, a very simple uh, very simply looking an innocent looking model which is a central harmonic oscillator so that's the system uh, interacting with a bus of harmonic oscillators which is uh, which is the environment you can think of it of uh, uh, the bus especially the, that that's uh, you can think of it of of a uh, radiation electromagnetic radiation and the the, the central mode can be some mod in a cavity that you are interested in, for example. But this can also be all mechanical, okay? Uh, without going into the deeper into the nature, is, is it mechanical or, 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 or not? Let's assume that it is, that it is a, a mechanical system. So what, uh, um, this system of course can be solved because it's a quadratic Hamiltonian. However, the solution tells you very little. It's so complicated if you have environment bigger than a few degrees of freedom. Uh, the mode mixing is so huge that extracting some useful information. Uh, there is a series of very nice papers when the model was introduced in the 60s. Ulersma, who was fighting with this, uh, with this problem, and some people after him as well. But here, since we are interested in the transfer of information from the system to the environment, we can, as a first approximation, say, let's assume the system is so massive that it does not really feel the uh, uh, mechanical interaction of the environment. Okay? You, you can imagine a massive ball on a spring or something like that. But on the other hand, the system still is delicate that it will, it will decohere. And usually that goes in pair. The bigger the system, the easier it decoheres. So this is called recoilless limit. <clears throat> uh, this is called a recoilless limit. And uh, it's actually the opposite limit that is usually studied in the textbook. Whatever textbook you take on open systems, they will be quantum Brownian motion. It's uh, like has been known for from the 60s and traversed in all possible directions. But nobody is really interested in the recoilless limit because everyone is interested how this little system is uh, being kicked by the environment and how there is a uh, how there is the coherence is happening and all that. So we look from the other side, from the back, so to say. We look at the environment. Okay. Surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, the, uh, all the, the the substance, the 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 meat, the computational meat was far from being trivial. And if you want to do this recoilless limit uh, well, then probably the best way is is the is the pass integral, uh, pass integral approach. Of course, mechanical, not field theoretical, but but mechanical pass integral approach which uh, on its own produced a very interesting thing, a hybrid quantum classical solution. So the, the central system behaves almost classical and the environment behaves quantumly. 
That's quite interesting on its own. There has been a lot of interest in, in hybrid quantum classical systems recently because people try to somehow merge quantum and, and gravity. And uh, there has been some movement that perhaps we have to leave gravity classical, uh, but couple it to, to quantum matter. And then how do you couple something that is classical to quantum? And there, there has been quite a lot of going on on this hybrid quantum classical solution. And we have our, our own uh, our own version of it, so to say. Now, uh, in order to, mm, uh, now maybe the, the information will become more clear. So the uh, environment will um, encode, for example, the amplitude of the oscillation of the central system. So now you can ask, so how well I can distinguish different amplitudes of oscillations just by looking at the environment? How much time do I have? Really? Five minutes? Three? Okay. Uh, so how well you can, you, can, you can distinguish different oscillation amplitudes measuring only environment? And by measuring, I say you have in your uh, disposal whatever measurement you want, projective POVM. Okay? So the most basic, the most basic thing is the state distinguishability. That's the, so to say, that's the basic of all information theory, whether classical or quantum. Yes, you, you uh, imagine in, 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 in the communication scenario uh, receiver, you, uh, you know that someone is sending you some information from some alphabet, let's say letters. You are receiving something, it's fuzzy, and your task is to uh, uh, discriminate which letter or which uh, uh, which um, a character you received okay so this state distinguishability is it's really somewhere at the at the core there are different approaches to information there are different measures of of information we use this one we use this the most fundamental one so how easy it is to distinguish two states of environment which uh, correspond to to different uh, oscillation uh, amplitude of the central system and there are methods for that and quite surprisingly in the model that has been studied from I don't know Feynman Vernon probably 1963 was the first maybe the first study then Uyersma 1966 so we discovered that there is new integral kernel which is very similar to the to the integral kernels that that have been already known from from the 60s the noise and dissipation kernel um it looks very very similar to the noise kernel with just the uh, opposite uh, temperature dependence we call it quantum fisher information kernel because actually it's uh, it's connected to quantum uh, fisher information like when i told you that there are different approaches to information there is a shannon uh, for neumann approach and there is a fisher approach the, the fisher approach is this state distinguishability uh, so we we discovered that that there is well discovered we we introduced the kernel which uh, which looks very much like uh, one of the known kernels which has a very useful information because it says so how well i can uh, how well i can uh, get the 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 amplitude of uh, oscillating system from the environment now there is one one result which um, which pertains to the decoherence here yeah so like I told you, the decoherence is this monitoring that people has been studying from the early 60s. And uh, there is one uh, result. So what is the length scale of decoherence? So at what length scales the quantum properties are being destroyed by the interaction with the environment? This has been known. That's usually attributed to Wojtek Zurek. He used it in a, in a very, um, very, so to say, fundamental way, but I could trace it back to a Greek sounding scientist Papadopoulos from 1966. And this famous results, it's also one of the probably well known results of decoherence theory that the uh, decoherence scale, so the scale at which quantum superpositions are destroyed, is given by so called thermal de Broglie uh, wavelength. So, roughly speaking, above thermal. Uh, the Broglie wavelength, you will not see, or you will see little quantum coherences, so the superpositions are uh, suppressed. 
the visibility of superpositions is, or the, the, the visibility of interference is, 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 is low, and below it is high. Okay? So that is on one end, that is at the end of the system, so how, how is environment destroying the system? And we added to that the complementary result on the other end, on the end of, of the environment. So how well you can extract the, the, this uh, length information from the environment. And there is, uh, it turns out that there is its own uh, length scale. <clears throat> it's um, generally larger. We will, uh, uh, working in so-called uh, cadera legate limit, which is a high temperature limit, which basically is something like a environment at room temperature. Uh, we call it distinguishability length. As you can see, it has a there's a pointer here, no? It has a uh, inverse temperature dependence. Uh, to the decoherence length scale. And this has very nice logical explanation. So the, uh, the, the hotter the environment, the more destructive is its influence on the system, which means here that on the shorter lengths, it will destroy quantum, quantum coherences. But at the same time, the hotter the environment, the more difficult it is to extract any information from it because this information stays bound in the in the thermal noise, and this is this is this uh, temper inverse temperature dependence uh, here at the distinguishability length. Okay, um, there are also some peculiarities. For example, this distinguishability length it depends on something which is called uh, cutoff. <clears throat> I've been struggling with this cutoff dependence for quite some time, but finally I decided, okay, that's the nature, let's accept it. Uh, it has a physical, this cutoff has a physical meaning uh, for mechanical systems. For, for radiative systems, it's not, really, <clears throat> it's not really very physical. That's why I said, that let, let's assume that the system is mechanical. It's the highest, basically, it's the highest uh, frequency present in the environment. You can imagine that your environment has some molecular gas or something then you can you can imagine that there would be the highest the highest frequency at which those molecules can can uh, oscillate okay and this is and this is uh, this is the meaning of the cutoff of course for electromagnetic radiation probably you would have to take the cutoff at the order of per creation which means infinite cutoff um, but for mechanical system, this cutoff governs, it governs the, 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 the maximum frequency that is present in the environment. And this some, somehow makes sense because the, the, uh, the higher is the frequency with which environment can respond. So the, the shorter is the time scale, the, uh, the, sh the higher the resolution. Okay. Now, all that was presented to you as a decoherence picture, so system and the environment. This translates very quickly from uh, decoherence to measurement scenario. If you imagine that you are performing, a, you are measuring, you are trying to measure something, you need a macroscopic apparatus. At some stage of the measurement, there must be a macroscopic apparatus. So if you exchange environment to macroscopic measurement apparatus, you will get a, a model of uh, how well, well, given all, this, uh, all these assumptions, how well you can measure something. And more interestingly, there, uh, I was talking about the distinguishability lengths, but you can translate it also to a distinguishability or decoherence time scales, and this is actually how it started. So there will be a shorter time scale at which uh, quantum coherences are destroyed at the given length scale, but they will be also longer time which your apparatus needs in order to, to reach a given, given resolution. Now, this seems academic, but if you talk to the people who are trying to do quantum technologies, they want to uh, automatize them. So they want to perform measurements where a human will not have to decide when does the measurement end. This is one of the problems in, in, in quantum measurement. Not so many people speak of it, but if you talk to the practitioners, then there is a quite acute practical problem. When does the measurement end? Okay, so this can sort of like help you understand 
Ah, and why is it uh, why is it important? You want to automatize it. You want computers to take measurements instead of you to take millions of uh, of measurements, and they need a time window. You have to define time window. When does the computer stop the process and says the measurements ha has been complete? And as you, as you well here, there are length scales, but believe me that the, what people believed was the measurement time which was the decoherence time it's not the same as the actual measurement time which is this given by this uh, distinguishability time okay so now pizza thank you uh, thank you okay questions Rana? Maybe it's, it's a stupid question, but I have a question about this uh, decoherence time scale. Uh, does it scales? Uh, does it scale with the uh, amount of uh, energy, with the rate uh, flow ha. of the energy, ha. or entropy between ha. those two systems? Ha. The usual, uh, very good question. The usual belief is that it scales uh, that it scales with energy. So the more energy you exchange, the the shorter is the decoherence, the faster you destroy. But actually, it is not the energy; it is the correlations. It's not the entropy. In some sense, it can be related to entropy, but it's the ability to build up the correlations. The stronger correlations you build up, the um, the stronger the decoherence. In many cases, there is a one-to-one -one relationship with energy. So the more energy you exchange, the stronger correlations you build. So when you forget about the environment, the stronger is decoherence. So for example, stronger meaning that the same amount of decoherence happens faster. But it's a very good question. It's very tricky. OK, and the last question. Uh, if I understand correctly, large part of this business of measurement and the coherence relies on the procedure of partial trace of the environment uh, this is a mathematical procedure which is if i understand correctly understood in the following way you justified by stating that you measure also the environment but you don't notice the result but is it really all that well justified or I don't know what to say. Very, very good question. Also, yes, this is a uh, this is to a um, to a large extent that's an uh, um, intellectual procedure. That's why um, that's why some people who criticize the decoherence approach to to let's say quantum to classical transition, they say, ah, well, but you have to rely on partial trace. And uh, if there is no physical uh, way to perform partial trace, then that's basically intellectual activity. So without observer, you can imagine that everything stays entangled and there is no decoherence. But there are situations when, when, when this partial trace is not an intellectual activity. For example, when your uh, environment gets, or part of your environment gets destroyed. For example, absorptions of photons. Yeah, you can you can imagine to to a, some extent you can imagine that some photons which interacted somewhere, then they get scattered, they fly away, and at some point they get absorbed. So basically, if you make a cut there, you say they they disappear, they got destroyed. So this can be a justification of uh, of partial trace. But yes, in general, in general, very well spotted. There is this there is this loophole if you want to treat it as the as the uh, fundamental mechanism for classical reality. Okay, so let's thank Jarek for his uh, long and nice presentation again. And now I'd like to invite our director, Krzysiek Pawłowski, who will tell us how good we are. Supposed to be Samara yet, but we have to uh, move the presentation to this computer. It will be soon. Okay, uh, so this is the photo from 2022, what means that we should repeat our photo session probably this year to have something up to date. Uh, statistics, so in 2022 we had 88 publications, this year 113, 14, sorry. And what is very nice that more than half of them were this highly pointed publication, 61 publications for 140 points. This is, I would say, superb result. Uh, I looked what was the reason actually for such a good result. It was for in between that Physical Review A was promoted to 140, 
but we had only six PRA. So overall, we just published in better journals. So the result is, is very, very good. Number of researchers pretty much the same, but many PhD students uh, finished their PhD. Uh, not so many new appeared. That's why number of PhD students now is just 11. Uh, new projects. So this was a special year because we, uh, we had received many European projects. There was a big movement. So there were some projects given to CFT, which were then translated to other institutes. But also Michal Matuszewski joined CFT this year and uh, quickly he received uh, two new pathfinders. One pathfinder was already awarded to him. Jarek received Quantera. Uh, also Jarek Korbic uh, applied for the institutional uh, project, Welcome to Poland. And uh, Remik received this Hopon he mentioned during his presentation. Altogether, we had 28 research projects in 2023, so pretty much the same like 2022. Uh, the most important events, I would say, this big event connected to this decaphonic piano, which was already mentioned. Uh, concerning science, we have one science of Bozena. Uh, we received finally this uh, HR Excellent in Research Award for the Institute. This is actually, well, promotion, but also some obligation to improve the Institute in many aspects. Since January, we have access, we have access to IBM Q and there are groups which are programming on this prototype of quantum computer. Uh, I should thank you, especially uh, Michał Oshmanis, who was behind uh, and Adam were behind uh, discussions with uh, Poznanian Center for Supercomputing and uh, Networks, PCSS, and we have this uh, European project. Other events, we had three medals, one for uh, Ivo Białyński Birula, Wigner Medal, International Prize, but also one for uh, Lech Mankiewicz from a Polish Physical Society, and uh, Polish Academy of Sciences awarded Michał Oszmańc with Pinkowski Medal. We are organizing conferences, Quack, for instance, but also this Greek Smith Chopin. Uh, Gursha mentioned uh, Precise. This was summer school organized by PhD students. They were, we organized one event in, I was co organizer of this event in Paris, Polish French Symposium. Uh, Center for uh, this uh, scientific cent uh, Copernicus Scientific Center organized also a birthday party for for uh, Łukasz Turski, uh, as this is actually the last year for him in a, in a, in the scientific council of this institute of this organization. Uh, there were four PhD defenses. So Shubhayan, Julius, Jan and best received PhD this year, last year, sorry. And this is really incredible, but CFT started more patenting. So we have two patents, two submissions, one for this decaphonic piano, and the second was the European, the second was, was a European patent, uh, which is actually the output of a TeamNet project. And this is a method because you cannot patent algorithms. So this is a method. Uh, related to uh, quantum computers. Uh, what is coming? So uh, next scientific council is approaching. If you are planning a PhD submission, you should really focus on that. And uh, I hope that this year we have this renovation. So finally, all projects are, are ready. What means that we we'll start public purchases and there is a big chance that uh, this summer or autumn we have a big renovation of, of our institute. And that's it actually. Thank you for attention.